Hello again, everyone. Charles Banfield here with another Karate Canucks conversation. And today I'm, I'm extremely pleased to be joined by uh, Sensei Alex Atkinson. Uh, Sensei Atkinson is, a, is currently a ninth degree black belt with over 50 years of experience in various martial arts, including Shotokan and Kenpo Karate, uh, Five Animal Kung Fu, Judo, uh, Jiu Jitsu, Muay Thai, Kickboxing, and K1 as well. Um, a high-level uh, kata and kumite competitor, he was a five-time Canadian karate middleweight champion and has won several international tournaments. Uh, Sensei Atkinson branched out into kickboxing when it was still evolving as a sport in Canada and today is a senior official and tatami events ambassador with the World Association of Kickboxing Organizations, also known as WACO Canada. Sensei Atkinson's also played a key role in the establishment and growth of various martial arts organizations, including the Black Belt Institute, which he founded in 1980, uh, which features a style of Kempo Karate, which is a blend of uh, karate and Kung Fu. And um, the most recent of his um, uh, accolades and, and achievements is in, in 19, sorry, in 2017, he was inducted into the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame. So with that, um, I welcome uh, Sensei Atkinson. It's a real pleasure to speak with you today. Pleasure is mine. Yes. Excellent. So um, as I'm, you've seen, you've seen uh, some, some of these other ones that I've done, um, and they all start the same, essentially. Um, so I usually just throw a, a softball question to, to get the, uh, the ball rolling, and uh, um, then we get into a bit of a more of an in-depth conversation. So... Uh, so let's start with some general background um, about you, such as, uh, you know, where, where are you from and what prompted you to start your martial arts journey? Well, I'm from Toronto, Scarborough specifically. Um, what started me on martial arts, uh, it was a, uh, an interesting way I got started. Uh, most people would think that, you know, I had this big passion and everything, but that really wasn't it. My, I had an older brother who was studying judo at the time. And uh, he decided to buy me a membership for my birthday. So, you know, as a young kid, as an 11-year-old, he, he bought me a membership. So I can actually, I actually know the exact date that I started, which was uh, September 16th, 1963. Anyway, so... I thought my brother was, you know, he's, he's this wonderful guy. He's doing this. So oh, I can't wait to get me to do stuff. But what he actually was doing is he was a, he was a teenager at the time. He's five years older. He needed somebody that when he would bring his a girlfriend over to the house, that he could throw around the living room and, and impress his girlfriend. So, so that's how we got started. <laughs> we, from there, we actually became a, a judo family originally because well, all my brothers and my sister uh, took judo. Some of them stuck at it and some of them didn't. My brother, John, actually started, uh, I think he mentioned it was in May in 1964. So we used to do a, we used to do a lot of tournaments and, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun with it. Well, um, I know some of your earlier uh, guests have talked about Frank Atashita. Well, we, mm -hmm. have a, we, ha we had an interesting history with him as well. Because uh, my brother, older brother, was one of the senior guys, and he 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 became a couple of the he won a couple of awards from him for the judoist of of the year type of awards and stuff. So he he, he was very good at it. And mm -hmm. We were juniors, and so we used to go to the famous Tashida's uh, monthly, I think it was um, she eyes that he used to have in his club. And I just happened to be you know the same belt level and the same uh, around the same age as. Uh, Frank Atashita's son. So I got to, I got to compete with Ricky Atashita a few times. And, and so it was a really interesting history. And, uh, my, my father actually became very good friends with, with Frank Atashita. Um, just because, I mean, I think it was more from a parent thing than, a, than him being an instructor because we were, uh, you know, um, our family actually did really well. So, it, you know, they, there was a lot of, um, there was a, actually a lot of uh, notoriety that our family got from it. Let's put it that way. Even though they were mm -hmm. just small tournaments, we, we showed up all the time. You know, we, we meddled on them. So we were, we were doing pretty good. 
And that's that's how we got started. And, and my father became very good friends with Frank Atashita. And, and uh, it was a friendship they, they kept for a long period of time afterwards because as parents, they're around the same age. And my father was a senior um, police officer with the Metro and actually worked in, in the same division. So it was it, it, pretty interesting. So that's actually how we got started. And we spent most of the 60s, you know, doing judo tournaments. And... Uh, it's always interesting when I'm talking to um, Merriman Sensei, Chuck Merriman, because that's how he got started. Uh, he, he actually was started in judo and then he went to the karate before. And we know he's the godfather of karate for uh, North America. So mm -hmm. that yeah. was an interesting start. Yeah, I spoke with Sensei Wally Sloki as well. And he had a very similar story. He, uh, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but he was basically dragged to say <laughs> <laughs> um dojo and um, started training. And his father and and Sensei Hasta um, had a very good relationship as well. They they were yeah. quite quite good friends. So maybe your father was in the mix in there too. I'm not you know, I I think you know, as martial art instructors, we, you know, we become friends with the parents. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think you become a lot of them you keep for a long period of time. So. Yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was an interesting period of time. Um, I worked with um, on the judo with a guy named, um, oh, what was his first name? John Fisher. John Fisher, you know, back in those days, we didn't have any karate in our neighborhood, but we had, we had a judo club. And the judo club just happened to be next door. I, I worked uh, in the restaurant next door as a kid. Uh, you know, I washed dishes, and then when it got busy, you'd be a you know, somewhat short, short order to cook for them. And uh, we, we were actually like our family were, were what we, I would call dojo rats. We just li literally lived at the dojo. And so back then you, you know, you couldn't, you could not do jujitsu because as a kid, it wasn't until you turned 16 that you would be able to actually do jujitsu. So I had a, I had a buddy of mine and he, uh, we used to compete with each other and we used to compete at all these competitions. So we had the warm up mats in the basement and then uh, the, the mats upstairs. So we would do our judo classes because the kids were early and then later on the, the adults would come. So it, it, I mean, it was pretty, a pretty good setup. So we used to run downstairs. Like first of all, they teach the technique. We'd run downstairs, the warm up mats, practice the technique. So you'd hear this crashing on top of the, you know, the brake falls, pop, 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 pop. And then all of a sudden they'd stop. We'd come running back up the stairs because we knew it was a new technique. <laughs> yeah. And we'd run right, right back down. And we'd do the same thing, you know, for the whole night. And it, 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 they knew what we were doing. And back in those days, they used to let the floor take care of itself. So they decided one day, okay, they're going to invite us in and teach us a lesson to, um, you know, in jujitsu type of a thing. And so we'll never, we, we will never go down and sneak downstairs and do it. So sure enough, we come up and they had this big instructor. His name was Gord. And, and, and the guy was, was like, nobody liked to work with him because he, he was the guy that hurt everybody because he was so tough. Yeah. Well, we, they figured if he didn't cure us, nobody would. So first thing he does is he, he grabs us and he throws us halfway across the dojo. And we've never been throwing that far. And I don't think they got the response they were looking for because we ran back and we said, can we do that again? Because that was incredible because we couldn't believe how much, how, how far you could throw us. We never, and we didn't know any better, of course, because we were kids. And so that, that, that was a failed attempt at, at stopping us from doing uh, the jujitsu back then. <laughs> and how old were you at that point? Um, I, we were 12, like we started when we were 11, but like by the time we were 12, we were, we were down the downstairs doing the techniques and uh, which was good. Cause it was, yeah, you had enough of the judo background and, and the tr truth of the matter was that, you know, John Fisher would come and work on a, like on a tatami with you. And then when they were uh, like, when you're on your groundwork, you know, he'd stick you into an arm bar or, you know, he'd stick his thumb in your side of your neck, you know, and throw you over. And so we learned all those little, little things, right which was good. Yeah. So. Interesting. So, so where did the karate come into, uh, into things? Um, so that's more what you're known for, right? You know, the, uh, the, the, the karate aspect of your, of your careers. Yeah. So, so what ha would happen is that every so often they would get somebody in the area that would be teaching, um, 
you know, kung fu or karate and different things. So we'd go, but they'd be in a basement of a church, and they only lasted like three three months or something, and then they would be gone. And and then Kwai Wong opened up in Scarborough, and so I I went over there initially, but then you know I was only there for a very short time. Um, it didn't wasn't what I was looking for, and then I I met the the Chongs, and they had the Canadian karate kung fu, and you know. Little Dave actually was one of Soroka's black belt. That's where they brought the kung fu, the karate in. And he was um, he was he was back in the days with Monty Guest and like you know like that first. That, I'm going to say that first core of black belts, which are always your best core. And he had a cousin Dave who had the kung fu. So they opened up a school, and it was it was a combination of both. And that was actually a great way for me to meet a lot of. Uh, people as well because uh, Dave Chong mentored me in it and I'm, he still mentors me to this day of course and I, I was taken back by little Dave's kicks you know the, he was the guy you walk in and the kicks were you know you, you, you were swear he was kicking the roof <laughs> they were so good and then uh, Dave was the quiet one and he he had the, he had the whole systems down so so it was an interesting uh, start and then uh, initially I got my black belt from them and I opened up, uh, like I, I, tr I, I taught in their school for a while. When I opened up, I opened up in a basement of a church, in the basement of the church uh, in 1973. Again, I always lucked into things. I was playing hockey with this guy one time and uh, he was an older gentleman. He was an ex-boxer and different things. So we were in the dressing room and he was talking and Anyways, he was asking me, well, what happens? Because I was a smaller hockey player, of course. And what happens if a guy does this? And I, he liked my response anyways, how I would defend myself on the ice. And he mentioned that he had a club and they were looking for an instructor because they had lost their instructor. And so I, I went over and uh, started with him. Like we opened it up. Uh, turned out he was a minister. It was in the basement of a church. So hopefully the wasn't too much colorful language in the, in the dressing room, but uh, <laughs> And it's actually interesting because uh, Sam Malevsky had a place at the same corner that the church was. Uh, but I, I was there in 73, and I think he opened up in, uh, at Poplar and Lawrence like a few years later. It was probably, I, I'm not sure. But by that time, we'd already started the IT Kempo schools. Ron Yamanak and I got together because I, I met him through the Chongs, and he was running Oriental Studios which was a, a franchise back then. And there was a lot of really good instructors that, that had worked for them. And we met and, he, you know, Ron and I have a strange history because, you know, like we, we come up with a, an idea and it, it takes about three, about, about a minute and a half. And then we go and we do it. We run with it. So we decided we'd open up a club together. And uh, so we took, uh, we took our life insurance policies, which weren't very much. We borrowed against them in the bank and we got the loan to pay our first month and month's rent <laughs> and, and our deposit. That's how we get started. <laughs> wow. Wing and a prayer. <laughs> we did it on a wing and a prayer. And you know what? It's, uh, it's been an amazing life. That's all I can say. It was best best decisions we, we made. So. Very good. Yeah. So, and, and you're still involved now. Well, you, you started your career, you said in, in 60, was it 63? You said 63 were kids. We're, we're, like I said, we were dojo rats. We just lived there. We do two, three classes a day, hang out there. It was, it was, it was a great life. Yeah. Yeah. So you're closing in on 60 years now involved in, in, in the martial. Yeah. yeah I'm, I, I can tell you exactly uh, be 60 years in 2020. Uh, September 16th. It was a couple of days before my birthday. My brother decided to, uh, and so I, I, it's an easy one to remember. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, so you mentioned a few of the, um, you know, your key instructors and so on, um, including, you know, Sensei uh, Atashita and, um, you know, John Fisher and, and the uh, Big Dave and Little Dave Chong. Um, what, what about, um, uh, students? Do you have any, you know, students that, that of note that, uh, you know, came through your, the, the various systems that you were training and coaching and teaching in? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, well, probably, you know, I, I gotta say that like when we got, 
did the Black Belt Institute. My brother John started with us because they're, they're, you know, you know, I, he's I'm the older brother. He's the bigger brother, though. Like, you know, I'm I was always a lightweight, middleweight. He was always a heavyweight. So, um, it, so he was he he was one of the first, of course. And uh, I mean, he's you know he's been a North Americans champion forever. You know, and he, right now, I mean, he's he's actually worked with um, you know keeping the CKK going. He's one of the advisors to it all the time and there's not very much that's done that he doesn't have his hands on mm -hmm. and he lives in Arizona now. So he's actually uh, with uh, Chuck Merriman actually works out of his club all the time. He, you know, John, he teaches guys out of there, but anybody who wants to get a hold of him now, you know, pretty well has to talk to John because I mean, he, he, he's the guy that at his age, he, he kind of screens a lot of them. So yeah, yeah. everybody wants a piece of them. Right. And, uh, Whenever anybody comes in town, like um, I remember when Pat was coming, moving to uh, before he, he moved to get to Los Angeles, he was, you know, he, he gave John a call and and John says she had no problems, you know, because, you know, Chuck and, and Pat have a great relationship. But Pat just called him because he, he knew he could get a hold of him. So, so uh, which you're, you're talking about Pat McCarthy, correct? Yeah. Or, yeah. And, and actually, when my brother was out teaching in Alberta. He got a job with Petro Canada. He, he went out there. He decided to start self defense classes, and uh, he was making more off the self defense class than he was with Petro Can. So he landed up opening up a dojo. He actually took away. He took um, over a dojo. You know, one of the guys from Quebec had opened one up there, and he had taken it over. And so, I mean, uh, you know, back then Mike Miles was uh, he was uh, and JJ Lee were the big guys out out in Alberta at that time. So mm -hmm. and then John moved in and. Anyway, so he, he, he used to go from there and then Pat was in Vancouver. So he, he would, he would go to Vancouver, you know, once a month and they would train for the weekend and come back. And, and so, yeah, it, it, yeah I mean, he's definitely one. Um, we had Mike Svetkovich, of course, he's a local Orangeville guy. And, uh, you know, he was a guy that nobody, like, you know, they look at him, you think, oh, this guy can't fight. And he was actually one of the first guys to win a triple crown, like the, the, um, uh, triple rated uh, tournaments back that Karate Illustrated uh, did in, uh, and I mean he's he had an amazing like there, there's just so many things that uh, like he had so many he won so many competitions he I think as a black belt he placed once and then he he was virtually first second every every time afterwards right so he was an older guy didn't look like he was doing much but boy he just they had great timing and focus. And then, of course, uh, Musamo Nawaz, and uh, he's the um, NSO for, um, for, for the country, for WACO. He, he's uh, president of WACO Canada. Uh, he's, yeah. he's the one that's really been the one that's been instrumental in bringing amateur, like changing amateur pro uh, kickboxing in Canada. And so... Uh, he does a lot of that. He's been, he, he's actually very good. He's helped a lot of the provinces set up their provincial sports organizations. He's very good at that. He's, uh, his two, his coaching courses, he's a, um, he's got a master's in kinesiology, master in physiology and a PhD in education. And he held five world professional titles. So it, it, it's a really great program. Um, so I get, I get, I get access to him all the time. So. A pretty good mentor to have in kickboxing and K1 and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We've had we've had a number of champions, right? So. Excellent. Yeah. So um, I'm curious about, you know, throughout the, the 60, almost 60 years that you've been involved in, in, in the martial arts, um, I'm curious about, uh, you know, how the training, how your training has evolved over time, you know, how, how you train yourself, how you teach, how that has changed over time, because, um, um, you know, others that I've spoken with, you know, they, they've mentioned that if they continued training like they did <laughs> yeah. back in the day when they first started, they probably wouldn't be able to move now, or in some cases um, would not be, would not be involved uh, in the martial arts uh, today because it just wears on them. I'm just curious about, you know, your journey, your personal journey, um, you know, well, you know, we're, we're loaded with injuries. 
Um, but you know, the, the beautiful thing about it is, you know, you crack your collarbone, it gets stronger. If you, mm. you know, you break a bone and it repairs, it repairs stronger. So it, it's actually, you know, it, that part of it, uh, the wear and tear on single joints, like the knees, they, you know, they, they, they take their toll, you know, you, you don't do as much rotating on them as you used to. You design, you know, uh, techniques and how to do it. The shoulders are, right, you know, that's a, you know, it's a socket type, um, it's a socket type uh, bone. So what happens, you've got m multiple movements on it. Um, usually what happens with that is the anterior part of your shoulders that, that wear out the, the most. So I developed a lot of programs early, you know, and, and they call that an agonist uh, move. And I do the antagonist move, which is we'd be pulling stuff back. All, I work my back recoils just as much as I do with the, the actual punching. So it's been able to, you know, offset that part of it. Um, as we get older, there's modifications and, and, and with the modifications, uh, you know, I've been very lucky because my health has been pretty good. Um, and I've worked with a lot of, like a lot of my students are now are older. So we, you know, you've got to take each individual. So let's say somebody, you know, starting to, they've had so many ankle injuries and stuff that they, their balance is off. You know, they used to, they used to have this body flow class that they used to do. And, you know, they, you go into the warrior one, warrior two. And if you, if you line your body up straight rather than in your traditional stance, it, it actually has a different benefit. It, it, it starts to develop the balance. So you can take somebody like that before you move them back into it and you can work that type of positioning with them. Um, the modifications, like, like it's not rocket science, but it is. Uh, you know, older, older adults, I call it, uh, you know, for a lack of a better name, you know, hip replacements, you know, what set of exercises do you do for rehab, but what set of exercises after rehab do you do? Um, you modify it or, uh, what I always like to do is look at a person and, and, and look at them individually. And, you know, it's when you're younger, you can sort of do the, what do they call it? The cookie pattern for everybody. Everybody can do the same because everybody has a similar goal. But as we get, yeah. you know, as we get older, we, we, we get off of that, you know, and, uh, shoulders injuries are common, back injuries are, are uh, you start doing exercise. I'll give you a good example. You know, you got somebody in the club and their knees bothering them, you know, and what are they, what are they still doing? They're still doing that snap kick the same way. And, you know, it, it's the definition of insanity, you know, you know, doing the same thing and expecting a different result. So you, you modify it and you, you take it and you, you, you learn the science on it, you know, as a single joint movement. And then you work it and you work it functionally and, and you, you, you'll never be 25, 30, 35 again. Uh, but I think you can actually, you know, you, you would be very surprised what you actually can do later in life, mm -hmm. you know, by modifying and, 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 and actually taking a scientific look at it. Yeah. You know, the coaching, give you an example. When I was, when I was a, a kid, eight years old, with coaching this is the worst example i could ever hear of coaching but we played hockey and so we had a coach and for hockey and the, the coach decided that at eight years old they should teach us how to fight so what he, what he was saying is he had them all on the ice and he said it's, and the gloves were a little different they had a thicker thumb on the gloves so he says the first thing you do is you don't take you throw your gloves off you hit them with the thumb in the eye and when his eyes are water and then you and you throw, start throwing your punches well, we know that's that, you know, I mean, coaching today, I mean, coaching back then, that was, I mean, the guy would have got charged, <laughs> you know, and the liability, I mean, he would have lost his home and you just, but that's the type of coaching that they, you know, that you grew up with. It's normal. Yeah. yeah. The coaching's changed. The training's changed. We're, we're updated. There's no reason like, you know, that, in, that with what we know about fitness, that, that we can't still perform at a very high level. Yeah. And, and, and it's just adding a little science. And even with our athletes, and we call them athletes rather than fighters sometimes because, you know, fighters are, if you want a professional, you want to call them a fighter. If you want an amateur, you want to call them an athlete. Their whole training by framing in that way will change. 
Uh, all right. You'll take the science of it. You'll look at you'll look at your athlete. You'll test him. You'll test him for for his technical skills, his tactical skills, his mental skills, and his conditioning. And so what happens is you can you can you can actually put him in a, a, a um, you can frame him and say, okay, well maybe his mental skills. So what do I do for mental skills? And if if it's conditioning, you put him on conditioning. And, and so you can actually make him a better athlete and a better competitor and, uh, and just by doing that. Mm. It's an easy test. I mean, you know, you test, you test all the skills and then you see where the weaknesses are and you're only as good as your weakest thing. So then we, and you, then you improve. Yeah. So back, back to the, you know, the old school way versus, you know, the more scientific approach that you're, you know, espousing yeah. now. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the cookie cutter, you know, approach to, you know, younger, younger students and so on. Do you still take that same approach to, you know, to when, when you're, when you're teaching kids or young, young adults or, or whichever, or have you evolved the way that you teach younger people as well to sort of, um, I don't know, maybe prevent <laughs> issues later on, you know? Yeah. You know, today it's, it, it, I mean, the instructors for kids, it's, it's hard you know, the world's changed, you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of parents used to just drop their kids off and, and trust that you, you know, you would do the best you could for them. And I think the most important thing about if you're going to teach kids is you got to like kids yes. and you have to be passionate about it because, and, and, you know, if you're true to heart and, and you're really, you know, and, and that's a balancing as, uh, aspect too, because I mean, if you get too passionate, you might push them too hard uh, and, you know, you still have to have, some objectivity as well. And so, yeah, if you're, if, if you're, if your intent is good, it'll be reflected in your, in your, in your actual teaching. So um, I love the kids, you know, and, and it doesn't matter. Like I, I don't care if a kid wins, loses and different things. I, if they're there day one and three months later, they've improved. I'm happy. If they do mm. it six months uh, later, I'm happy. If they're 10 months, as long as they're improving, it's a process. It's a journey. It's a wonderful journey that like most of the people that you interview have gone and they, they just, they're so passionate about it. I can't imagine what my life would have been without it. And uh, if I see somebody and I can give them the same joy that I've got out of it, I'll be very happy. Yeah. 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 So actually that preempted it. the next question I was going to ask you was, you know, what, what has kept you involved all, you know, through the years, but it sounds like it's, it's a passion project that, that never ends, you know, for you. I don't, I don't even, I've never thought of it as work. You know, it's, it's something that I got up every day and I look forward to it. Now don't misunderstand me. There were times, you know, when, you know, when you're earlier, when you had a family, you know, you've, you're starting your family, you're running a business, you had all those pressures and, and, you know, there's a lot of young people with that today. You go into the classes and you were teaching classes all day long and, you know, you're just, you know, the next day you do the same thing. It almost became like digging a hole and filling it in, digging a hole and filling it in. So, you know, it, it's not that you, you, you know, somewhere along the line, you can sometimes lose track of that balance for yourself. Mm-hmm. And then you've, then you've got to change your, your work schedule and start to do other things that bring you joy within the martial arts and, instead of just digging that hole every day so once you get once you once you understand that it's perfect and like i said i i, I got nothing but positive things because i put my kids through university you know you know my, uh, I, like my wife and i have a you know a, a comfortable home it, it allowed us to 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 have a, a good lifestyle as well so mm-hmm. so if, if you see that with kids and different things they're the next generation i mean uh, you know, we're 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 pretty well done. Yeah. So you, you mentioned Zoom using Zoom technology for um, for teaching and so on. Have you been successful in retaining majority of your students, or um, um, has that been been working for you? Well, for me, I, I freelance, so I mean, uh, I don't have the overhead that most people that I made. I I got all a lot of stresses out of my life as I got older. And so that, you know, if I want to take a vacation, I don't have to be checking at the office on the way home. I, you know, I shut all the, the stuff off. So for me, it's different. I, you know, I've made those changes and 
uh, you know, the, the group that, that I train, a lot of the groups that I train, uh, they're older. And we've actually been very successful for the most part all year round being able to do it outside, now, depending on the lockouts. So I, I give credit to them. And we had a great winter. So, you know, we've been able to do all our stuff outside, uh, an extra layer of clothing. Um, and then um, the Zoom stuff, you know, we've been able to do workshops and stuff on Zoom. And it, that was a challenge to, you know, at, at first. Um, so we learned how to do it. And, uh, you know, you get a couple of people who actually, younger people who actually have talent. You put them in the, in the background and you do a little bit and then you can, you can get back on screen and critique as you're going. It, it works out perfect. You know, so you get the, you know, that uh, younger group that have the talent. They're in the, the best talent uh, years of their life. In the introduction, uh, when I was running down through the the different um, uh, start styles and, and arts that you you'd been involved in, and um, you and I were chatting before the uh, before we started, you know, this this recording, um, and K one was was mentioned. Can can you share a little bit about your involvement with with that organization, K one, or 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 that that style, I guess, of of well, like I said, I, like with Waco Canada, you know, I, I, I'm i one of the spokes in the in the wheel because, I mean, I have a, a fa fabulous team. We, uh, You know, it's great from the top down. Um, it's it's I got uh, actually in back um, in with K1. Um, I had a friend I was running one of our uh, like I, I used to get a group together because we had different clubs and. I, it was kind of like what Shintani used to do, you know, so you learn from the, from the older guys, right? Mm -hmm. He used to run a program in, in Hamilton where you could come and you, I think at the time it was $5 and pay for a class. And so uh, guys who would come and pay for it and, and sitting down with them once before he, he, you know, he didn't want the, the, you know, the headaches of running a club. So he ran it through, you know, I think it was the Y program or like, like fitness thing. So, he didn't have it so he just got paid to and teach and it was not so much stress and so a lot of, of, of karate people would come where he was uh, you know once a week in hamilton they'd pay it they'd get their training and that was great well i did kind of a similar thing with our group i, I put it together and it was on a saturday and i used to run it literally could walk across the street uh, i had a friend louis malonis who had a club he was a canadian karate kung fu guy and uh he uh, he rented me the club, the floor space for a couple hours. I brought them all in, and uh, you know they're all senior senior black belts and stuff, and it, it was fabulous. And so he ran a uh, he ran a K one organization. So what I did with him is I I started training. Oh, it was oh sorry, just a second. it was more of a yeah. Anyways, it was more of a um, a Muay Thai. Club. And he, he, he's a member, I think, of the international tie. And so I started and I was, I was about 50 at the time. So, you know, you think about it. It was my worst start. I got to tell you, like, you know, I mean, it was just a, I wasn't very good at it at first. It was good thing that I had other experiences because, you know, I could relate to it. Yeah. And it became much easier when I related the, when I could relate to the fact that it was some, um, um it wasn't any different. Well, and it was actually good in helping me understand that, that, that none of the arts are different than the other one. I love the striking arts. Um, the Thai arts were, were, were easy because even in your clinch, what you do is, you, you know, like most people try to, you got to be able to do an upper body throw. Yeah. So the, big, the biggest problem I saw when I was doing it, when I was officiating it, is that, that most people wouldn't bend their knees. And that's the, actually because you can't, you, can't, you can't throw your hip, you can't do those type of rotations. You bend it, you break them that way, coming forward, and then you, and then you do your step back. And it's almost like your Taekyoko Shodan where your first move, you're turning to the side with a block or, or the big turn at the end when you're doing the turn, which is, it, it, it relates to Taiyatoshi. It's actually Taiyatoshi in judo where you- Yeah, drop throw, yeah. You come into it and, yeah. and it works perfect. Well, that's the footwork. It's the exact. So once, once you made the connections, it was easy. And because, you know, I had a boxing background with it because, you know, when we were, when I was younger, I pulled a hamstring on my leg. And so for a year I spent uh, boxing 
you know, because mm-hmm. I couldn't throw a kick. It was a really bad hamstring pull. So rather than waste time, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, you have to you do what you can with what you can. So anyways, we got the, so I, I started the K1 and it took me, you know, I, I mean, it, once I made the connection that it was the same, like, you know, people call it a tie kick. They, they, a lot of guys call it a tie kick and stuff like that. It's a kick to, to the quadricep. The kicks have to be, you know, three centimeters above the, the knee or three centimeters below the knee because you can't do it on the joint for the obvious reasons. Um, it's, it's a, you know, some people will do a rotation with it in a chop, you know, which we, we did in, my, in traditional, or I'll say just do a, a, a rotation where they just stand upright and throw it. It doesn't matter, you know, whether if they were digging their shin to the nerve, it's just a roundhouse kick. A variation of roundhouse kicks. Uh, I mean, we've got hundreds of variations of it, and yeah. it really was just a kick to to the nerve or to the leg with a desired result, of, uh, you know, of, of going through uh, to to the bone to bruise the bone. You, you, you know, and using the proper weapon, uh, not necessarily foot, putting the shin in and digging it in. So that, like, if you look up at, at what you want to get out of it, it's easy, mm-hmm. and you break it down. So, so it, it wasn't that difficult. I mean, uh, the, the stances were a little different. I mean, but they were easy to adjust. So, so anyways, I, like I said, it's my worst start. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> no matter what anyone says, it's my worst art. But, uh, you know, like generally I was still 50 in my 50s and I came off, you know, like a, a pretty good um, uh, career of, of competing. So I, I had the compete level and I also, you know, I was always a guy who, I did, I worked hard and I always tried to work harder than my competition. So I just worked at it and it came and, and I found a lot of them were actually lacking the, the general conditioning. And, and what I mean by that is that they're amazing athletes and the ones that are the elite, they've got that out. But most, most people who go or, in the, you know, it starts off recreational and then as they, they go on forward, like they're, they're, they're novice, intermediate and elite most of them, you know, I, I, I would actually set them up road work to do, uh, you know, and there and, and have for them to do it. And, and the guys that did it had great success. The guys that didn't do it, didn't understand. And you really have to train them like an 800 meter uh, racer, you know, like somebody who's running an 800 meter and it worked out perfect. So, so all that stuff I had, I actually understood that. So it became easy. But, uh, you know, because I had so much success with the other stuff, by the time you're in your 50s and that you're, 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 in a, you're, you're decreasing, you're not increasing because, you know, you lose a 1% of our muscle mass between the ages of 40 and 65. So you'll lose, you know, 25% of it. So, you know, the science says that, you know, you're not, you're not going to be who you were when you were 25 and 30 and 35. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and it was, it was a great experience and I, yeah. I still continue it and met some wonderful people with it. Like, you know, we, there's so many amazing uh, Thai coaches out there and athletes and net world champions and you get the chance to work with them. And, and, you know, I mean, it's again, it, it, what they gave me, you know, expanded everything that I do, not just. So throughout your, throughout your uh, martial arts career and, and especially in, in um, you know, the experience that you've had in different styles, different forms of, of martial arts and martial sports. Um, I'm sure there have been some realizations or eureka moments or little epiphanies that there are sometimes large epiphanies uh, that, that, you know, sort of come reveal themselves uh, to, to you, I, I'm sure that have revealed themselves to you. Um, are there any prominent ones that kind of come to mind? Like, things that that when you suddenly understood or suddenly realized uh, it changed your approach to training, practicing, teaching, that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. Every day, (laughs) every Every day, day. (laughs) you know, every day it changes. Um, I think what's happened is that, you know, the, the, you know, if we start back in the sixties and how we coached and uh, you know, one thing about coaching and their instructors are passionate. And, 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 you know, you, you get it, but I mean, just because we've learned more over the, the day, it's going to evolve 
uh, even more in the next 10 years. So uh, looking back behind it, uh, you know, and where, where it was always a process. And I think the process starts, you know, with a, with a simple thing is that when you're, you know, when you're, um, when you're a yellow belt and you, you throw your first back or white belt and you throw your back fist reverse punch, you know, you, and then all of a sudden you, you realize, well, you know, if I change the angle a little bit, that that'll do it. And I think the biggest one is when we actually wrote, wrote the stuff down and looked at the science and, and I'm just going to talk striking now. Mm -hmm. um, what happens is if you, if you write the stuff down, and you create a curriculum just like you do with your kata. So let's say yellow belt, you've got three basic katas, two basic katas that you, you for yellow belt. And you get like maybe two for orange belt and whatever. And then they, they become more difficult katas and you're expected to do them better. If you create a system with, with, with sparring the same way, working the angles, working the, the, the techniques, because if you, don't, if you don't design the science to it, and it comes from everywhere. Like if you check, you know, boxers are the best uh, that they've been doing it for a long time. Uh, a simple thing like a parry, you know, like I, most people think a parry, you catch one glove, you catch it with one, you catch it with the other. But, uh, you know, when you see guys like uh, Merriweather, you know, he's, he's, he's parrying with his, uh, his shoulder and his, his arms. And if you start looking at, at all the parrying and you, you start putting it with your blocks, you'll see there's not much difference with the striking. Yeah. And I think that's what, what, when, it, when it, it evolves all the time. And when, when I actually wrote it down and picked out the angles and added the defense to it so that you can actually do, like, you know, and it's the same thing in, in the kickboxing now with the amateurs. We, we actually have a program called um, KidSmart. And what it does is um, it, it teaches them their jab, their cross. And we learned that, that you know, by adding, you know, what we, we do couplets, combinations, and fakes. And, and we, they did them on a glove level, just like in karate. They did a yellow, an orange, a green, a blue, whatever. It, it doesn't matter the colors. But it's a, karate had such a beautiful way of structuring moving forward that when you apply it to, to the other arts, it, it, it all comes together. And it's the same. Like if you're doing a lunge punch in karate or you're doing a jab, and you add that outside arc angle to it. Mm -hmm. It's the same. I don't care what you want to call it. You want to call it karate, fine. You want to call it kickboxing. It has a different intent, like, you know. And, and so, by having a different intent, that's going to mold you to where you are. All you have to do is, is ha uh, train purposeful for an expected desired result out of it, and you will get it. So every day I do that because, I, like I said, I have access to so many world champions. Pick up the phone; they're on speed dial. You can, if you have a problem, you can call anybody. I mean, it's it, it's it's the network. And so, any day that it happens, it, you know, tomorrow I'm going to have another one. It, it, you know, it's uh, it, it's 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 moving parts. You know, uh, and, and I can I could nail I could say anybody's name in martial arts, and, and they left me with one. You know, I mean, Tom Sharkey when self defense did a gun uh, self defense. Uh, him and Chamery did it. The, uh, I'm going to say 1978, maybe maybe it was 79, maybe it was 81. I can't remember. Stuck with me forever. I had an epiphany. You know what they did is they they presented it in such a way. They, 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 you know, their ETF guys, they presented it in such a way that it made sense. And they were proactive in, in stuff leading up to it. They were proactive in identifying the, the, the assailant in front of you, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Cesar Burkowski, you know, I had an epiphany with him. You know, I, I was fighting for a long time travel and he says, why don't you, uh, why don't you do some kata? Why don't you do some stuff? So I did soft style forms. Landed up at the end of the year, rated K, you know, um, what do you call it? KI rated uh, number one soft stylist. <laughs> so, so, I mean, uh, and Caesar, I mean, I, I traveled all around the globe with him and Peter Gilpin and um, who else was it? Bill Adams and Steve Ooslis. Mm -hmm. And every day you had an epiphany. So, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, there, there's so many of them. Yeah. And every time I yeah. bought somebody and I, I got beat, I had one. So, <laughs> 
Yeah, if you don't, then you're going to keep getting beaten. So yeah, <laughs> yeah I, you know, I mean, it's 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 it, this is a wonderful life. You get it, you get it everywhere. There was never like a, a changing point. You know, it's not. It's I guess the changing point in in my thinking was after I had children, and I had to change. You know, like change it, but I, you have to figure a way to change it for the better. Uh, do you have a favorite technique or a favorite concept? that you like to uh, deploy or, or, or teach or perform? I'm glad you asked that one. Um, <laughs> I have many of them. I was lucky because I didn't necessarily have a great technique. I was, I was a average kicker at one time. So I, I started throwing 1500 kicks a day to, to improve on it. Um, so I found that it, it, it was, I was lucky because I didn't need to, I had to actually be able to think when I was out there and change and change the technique according to who I was and to, and, and also with what we were doing, you see, because the same techniques in a self-defense work in competition, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because uh, one of the, one of the guys I had met before, um, Henry Chuchunk, he was a, a real good Kempo artist, and he, he, we trained together all the time. He um, he, he thinks self-defense. I was thinking sport at the time, and we worked together, together, together. And it's interesting how many of the techniques were the same. Mm -hmm. But the situation, like if you've got a left foot forward person and they're doing it, if you've got the, a right foot forward, you've got to change your strategies. Um, maybe, maybe you're right side's weaker but it may be stronger on it so it was it was more of a chess game from don james i learned that uh, you know the strategy like you know he always his he always had a, a thing where it looked the same and he had three or four techniques that, to follow it so the strategy from him and his timing and focus was second to to nobody the only guy i ever seen come close to it was a guy named philip poon in uh, in bc he, uh, another guy was built like Don James and, you know, you, you could have swore it was like the, the two of them were, were, were the same because they moved the same. They had the same strategies. They were like the, some of the best chess players you ever want to meet. So, so it, 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 and then there's Carlos Newton. He, he, he was a good one too, because mm -hmm. he came to a 12 hour training session that we had one time, did one little bit refresh my memory because i used to always think it was a conversation that you had with your opponent you'd throw your hand out see what they did and then oh, i'm going to see what he did and he did that but i've never seen a guy never seen a guy who who became a tie boxer moved inside became a wrestler took you to the ground uh, you know but but not just one technique this guy like it was 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 the whole package he did the tie then when he went to the wrestling, he was a wrestler. Then went into the Brazilian, he was the Brazilian. Yeah. Um, you know, and boxing skills. I mean, the guy's boxing skills. He was he was a boxer. So, so you learn from everybody. Uh, he's yeah. one of the few guys that I, I, I actually seen that didn't just have a little piece of the puzzle. Just became that animal. So you know, I mean, it's. I don't know if this answers your question, but. Uh, there's never a favorite technique because that conversation is going on all the time and you you're changing. And when you change, you've got to have three or four strategies like Don James, you've got to become uh, Carlos Newton. And when it comes to become that animal, you know, cause that may be the, the one because every artist is, is vulnerable to something else. And so when you see somebody in front of you, Benny, Benny, the jet was one of the best ones too. Benny, Benny had a little thing before he went, he just dropped his body down. And, and, and if you move your hand one direction, he knew exactly what you're going to do. His actual paint that he would do right from the get go was, was, was unbelievable. I mean, <laughs> he, he could read everything you did just by just dropping down a little bit in his stance and seeing how you react to it. You know? Yeah. So you learn, you learn it from everybody. You use those things. I mean, if that one, if I use his and it works, you know, John Park, they used to have that, they went into that side stance, they'd hit you hard with a side kick, you know, psychologically try to, uh, you know, change your game. And then, you know, after that, if you reacted to that, then you, they're going upstairs, downstairs, they're going all around. So, so you, you have actually, you have to have the ability to adapt to it. So favorite technique, whatever's going to work on the opponent, 
And if it doesn't work, <laughs> well, you know, you'll go back to the drawing board and do another one. <laughs> yeah, pick a new favorite. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Another question I like to ask as many people as I can is, is um, uh, questions about styles. So as somebody who's, who's studied a number and practiced and, and competed in, in various, you know, arts and so on, um, you know, outside the dojo, do you, do you think style is relevant? Does it matter which style you belong to or, or which style that you're studying? I think the instructor is more important. The instructor is more important than the style? I think the instructor is more important because if you get a good instructor, a good mentor, like, like, I, like, I, like uh, I try to find the best mentor I can find in each system and then I sit and I listen to them because uh you know like when we were talking about Carlos I mean I I just was in awe of watching him actually move and how mm-hmm. he presented it and different things so you know you, you get that uh, and again you know John Park uh, mentioned earlier was a great uh, inspiration to me watching him and, and our club, like, you know, the Chongs, they had the original group was Tony Facetti, Joe Lafitte, you know, and like guys like that was back in Wally's day. And those, those guys were just rock stars, right? They were yeah. that good. You know, we were a different generation. So um, Caesar was a good mentor to me. Uh, Ron Yamanaka was a good mentor. Um, uh, Mazamo Nawaz is a great thing. I mean, how, how can you not listen to a guy that's held five professional world titles and the, uh, I mean, he's his his master's is in education, so his instructing is, is incredible. Um, when it came to officiating, uh, when I started officiating the full contact, you just uh, we were lucky because we had so many great uh, mentors, and, and they were all willing to work with you. You know, they had more, way more experience. Like if you go in and you think I know more than they do, you're you're wrong. Like you know, you go in, you empty the cup and you just learn as much as you can. And I've been lucky because uh, I've, I've had access to so many, so many people that, that can change your life. Mm. Yeah. To keep an open mind, obviously. Yeah, you can. You know what? We're learning every day. You stop learning, you stop living. So you were, you were just talking about instructors, um, you know, how the instructors more important than style, you know, especially for building, uh, as, as I think you said earlier, you know, building the students um, from the ground up. Um, I'm curious about what your opinion is about um, what is a showdown or what does a showdown mean to you in whether it's in karate or in judo or, or any other, any other art that has that ranking system. Um, what would you characterize as, as a as a showdown? Well, you know, uh, probably the same as most people that the learning just is just beginning. Like you get your you get your black belt in any art, or you you know, and you know, they, in, in Thai they have different the levels, and the, in the um, kickboxing they have different levels, and kung mm-hmm. fu they have different sashes. So that that black belt level is it, you're just beginning. I mean, it's uh, you've got your basics down, hopefully. Uh, if not, you know, you go back and work them some more. You've got the basic, you got the basics tools. And then now that you can actually learn, it's kind of, I look at it like a, you get your BA from an education and then you're working on your honors BA. And then you're working on your master's and then you're working on your PhD. So you, you've got your BA, you, you're, you're out of secondary school, you, you're, or you finished your post-secondary and uh, on your, on your BA and now you're, now you're 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 moving forward. You know, BA is gonna BA is good. Don't misunderstand me. It's you know, it's you have to work hard to get it. Um, you know, if you have a love and a passion, you're looking to be a BA. You want to get your your PhD in it, and then that eventually maybe be, you know, that um, person that lectures the world, right? So. so, in terms of proficiency levels, then. If you're, you know, once you've received your your shodan, your first degree uh, black belt, should you be able to? You said, you know, you should be teachable at that point. Should you? Well, I think you're teachable, and you I think be able to teach also. Like, should you um, be- I, I think I think you can teach before that to tell the truth. Um, I, you know, I've had orange belts uh, in a kids class, and you know, I've had a white belt, and and, and maybe the kids by a little older orange belt, and it hits his responsibility 
because I've got an older kid me mentoring him mm -hmm. that he'd be a good example to mentor the, the new person in the club. I mean, that mentor system, if you can set it up in your, in your schools and, it, and it's a natural thing, it's really a natural thing. So it, it's all relevant in teaching because every kid comes in, they're different. You have some kid who, you know, comes in day one, has all the tools and you have one who doesn't have the same tools, you know? Like, so I think what happens is that, you know, each kid is different each and mentors are all different because, you know, you may have somebody, it's usually if they have a common interest, they make a good mentor, you know? So we have, we have a girl who teaches for us and she's the best, like, you know, people, people today have mental health issues and I've never seen an instructor like her. Like she's not going to teach you um, necessarily to be a world champion, but I mean, she, she communicates better than anybody I know. So when they come in, they're all different. And so it's a re like, even when there are black belts, they're different because, you know, some people want to go for katas and some people look at it from a self-defense perspective. Some people look at it like, you know, performing, like, you know, performing katas and performing demonstration arts and stuff. So there, there's such a wide range. Like, you know, you, you, if you're specific, are you, you know, if it's specifically to fighting, then, you know, and it's specifically to kata and specifically to basics and they're all different. You know, they all have, like, you may score a 75 and a 90 in different areas. And, and, you know, I, I, as long as the total scores is, is, is passable and it's good. And I, I look at it from each individual. We all have something different we have to work on. So black belt gives you the tools of martial arts, um, but the, but it, it, it one doesn't fit all, you know, so they're not every, not everybody's going to be passionate about tournaments, not every, you know, cause some people come for self-defense, but they may excel in that area. What I want to do is help them discover what they specifically want and, and design their training program for them. Okay. Uh, as, as someone who's, you know, competed a lot, um, over the years um, at a high level. Um, and we were talking again, before we started recording here, we were talking about um, the, um, the Olympics and, uh, and karate in the Olympics. And I'm just curious about your, your uh, thoughts on sport karate and specifically Olympic karate. Do, do you think, do you think that, you know, karate being included in the Olympics this year, given that it's, uh, it was supposed to be last year, but it had to be postponed due to COVID, obviously. Um, do you think that will be a good thing ultimately for, for karate or, or not? I hope it is. Now, you know, we don't know the exact outcome, but I mean, it's long overdue. I mm -hmm. mean, if you look at, at, you know, when we grew up, probably the biggest art out at the time was karate. And it was even still bigger, even when David Carradine brought out the Kung Fu, you know, it was, you know, everybody wanted to be a Kung Fu guy with him, but, but it, it, it has deep roots. Um, it has deep roots. I, I, I think what happened is, is that it's virtually a, a new sport art because it really, the sport didn't start until it was in Japan in the early 1900s and the Okinawan arts, they, they used it more as a self-defense. And it should have been a, a Olympic sport a long time ago, uh, when it had it, when it was, when it was at its peak of popularity, would have been a perfect time. Um, I know a lot of the athletes, uh, and I've been fortunate to actually train with some of the athletes and their coaches and stuff. And you know, our Pan Am coach Roman, like uh, the guys, in, when he was doing the Pan Ams, he, he's an incredible coach. I learned so much from him too. Right? You get these guys in a room, you can't learn yeah. from them. There's something wrong. Um, magnificent coaches. Right? Uh, I, for their sake, I hope that the coaches, because the coaching and in sport is is is, is huge. The athlete that have the actual chance to compete in the Olympics is, is, is spectacular. And um, I don't have the answer to it. You know, I mean, I really don't. I, I love the sport. I love every sport that way, especially with martial arts. Uh, you know, you can, it's, 
I, we don't know if it's going to be this come in the, in the next one, you know, like, uh, well, um, it's, you know, it's a demonstration sport this time. So we'll have to wait and see what happens yeah. and, and what kind of hole we can have with it. I mean, I, you look at the, the world Taekwondo Federation. I mean, it, 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 it went in early. They were smart. It's just it, Taekwondo is actually a younger art than karate and, and it's, yep. it's solidified itself there. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any question about the, um, the opportunity for, you know, increasing awareness and, yeah. and, and, you know, promotion of karate as a, as an activity, as a sport. Um, um, but, you know, I've, I've spoken to a number of people both, you know, on these, on these, um, um, conversations and, and, and off as well. Um, and a number of people, particularly the, the more traditional, um, stylists, I guess, are concerned that it's going to take away, it's going to overtake the traditional aspect of, of karate. You know, there, there's some that have argued that, um, judo has suffered as a result of being introduced into the Olympics back in the sixties. And, and similarly with Taekwondo, it's, it's more popular than ever, but, um, the activity itself is different. Yeah. Well, we, we, we're actually one of the groups for the next ones that they're looking at, like with the kickboxing, um, actually the, um, Muay Thai, the international organization, they're one of the five sports. So, We've mm -hmm. got the, the kickboxing they're looking at for, for the next one. So if it's not the next one, it could be the following one. And, and, and Muay Thai is actually in it. So they, they pick five sports. And then from there, they, they actually choose two of them as a, yeah. as a program. So they're already in there as well, right? And, you know, it's, I think it's just a matter of time before they're actually in there. And then they're going to go through the same process. You know, the, it'll be, you know, a demonstration sport. And if it, if it catches on, it'll stay. We're going to so. see. I, what I love about the traditional karate tournaments is the, the way they do kata. You know, you have to do your shite and then your, it's your competition one and one. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you got to know more than one kata. Like, in, like the open ones, you can do one. But, I mean, you got to, you, you compete. And there's a real strategy to it. And there's some guys that are really, coaches that are really good at helping you with the strategy and, seeing who you're going yeah. against and which one you can do. And it ad adds a, a, an incredible dimension to it. And so, yeah, they, I mean, they, they've got that right for sure. Yeah. 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 I think the rules state that you can repeat, but they can't be consecutive. You can't do yeah. one kata and then that same kata right away again. You have to do it. You have to know at least two, I think, is the or way the rules are. Well, you got to know a few of them because you, those two might not work against the next opponent, right? Well, so true. Yeah, yeah. They may yeah. be your two best ones, but, the, you know, whatever they do, you may have to. I mean, that, that's why I said there's, there's it, it becomes multi-level and the things that you can do and strategies. And so, I mean, and you get an experience coaching with that. Somebody who's been with the team forever, they. They, uh, they just know which one to put in at what time. Mm -hmm. So looking back through your, um, through your martial arts career, um, you know, you've, you've, you've had some very high highs uh, with, you know, um, high levels of success and in competition and also, you know, through the, um, um, through your own training, you know, your ninth Dan Hanchi, uh, that's pretty much the pinnacle <laughs> unless you found your own art. Um, I'm just curious about um, if you could do everything over again, is, is there anything that you would have done differently or, or actually the, the flip side of this, usually what I do is I, I say, I'm going to ask this question. It's two parts and you can answer one or the other. You can answer both. All right. So first part is if you could do it over again, is there anything you do differently or um, is there anything that you know now that you wish you'd known sooner? Oh, geez, that's uh, two loaded questions. Well, first of all, there is one thing I would change. Um, you know, I, when I would compete and it was over, I was already focused on the next competition because it was done. Uh, and I, I don't think that I ever took, like, you know, like, like I, we traveled around the country, we traveled overseas, we did all these things. I don't think at the, the, that particular point when you when you say you won a championship that I actually took the took that moment in. 
you know, where you sat there and you took the moment in and, and, and just enjoyed it because, you know, you, you may have won it, but then now you got to go back and work twice as hard to, to stay there. So, yeah. so I don't know if I, you know, never just sat on a podium or anything and just looked out and said, you know what, this is, this has been great. My brother could do that all the time. You know, like he, he could take the moment. And that's the one thing I, you know, I usually with young athletes now I say, look, you know, when you're out there and you, and you do it, you've got that opportunity, just absorb it and take it in. So that's one thing I would change, you know, because I, I guess I was that a personality. Right. And, and the second question was, you said something. The second question was, um, is there anything that you know now that you wish you had known sooner? whether it's a concept, a technique, um, a mindset. Right. I, I wish I knew, I, I knew uh, then what I know now because uh, it would be great. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm not too sure because, I mean, every, 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 every experience that I had brought me to where I am today. And I'm so grateful. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, you know, like when you, you have setbacks, it's how you overcome your setbacks. Uh, you have you know, your frustrations and, you know, I, I mean, the, the experiences that you have bring you to the person that you are. And, and I'm still working on being a better person. So um, I don't know if I would change it because I'm really, uh, really happy and content with my life. You know, I have wonderful children, you know, they're through universities, which is great. They've got their lives they're on their, you know, my, they can stand on their own two feet, which is great. You know, they're not dependent on me. I've got a wonderful wife, you know, that, that, that's a great partner. You know, I, I can still go up to Sudbury and see Don Goche and the group up there and hang out. And then it's never a problem, right? So so all that stuff, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite content. Again, if I, if I knew what I know today, back then, um, I would have a different result. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, it's been, a, it's been a wonderful ride. And, and that's not my quote. That was Rick Joslin's, uh, what he got his thing. He just said it was, a, I, I, that might not have been the exact thing, but it, that impacted me. And he said something like that. It's been a wonderful ride. And it has been. And he's one of my, my, my favorite guys as a coach. I, like, he's one of the best coaches I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. he, he's a pure gentleman. As a competitor, I got to compete against him uh, when he was at his peak and then I was coming up. And I mean, I just learned so much uh, uh, of being uh, a competitor, but even more important, important uh, yeah, being a gentleman. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, Rick. yeah he, he's, he's, a, he's a legend for sure. Yeah, for sure. He, he really is. And his son, Jeff, I mean, we, we see him at events and Jeff, you know, I mean, that second generation, uh, I talked to Ken Talek and with Rob and those, those, those kids are just so, well, they're not kids, they're, they're men, but they're, they're just incredible. They really are. You know, as somebody who, again, has had a lifetime in, in the martial arts, um, what advice would you give to anyone who is uh, looking to start? Either looking for an activity for, say, one of their children or looking for something for themselves? Um, are there any, any, um, any things that you would say, you know, that the people should look for, including, you know, any red flags that, uh, that you might want to alert people to, uh, to take note of? Well, you know, I, I actually look at it different than most people, because when I'm talking to a parent about, you know, when their kid's getting started is, is that I, I, I communicate as a parent. The single most important thing I ever did with my kids, it was put them into martial arts and, and, and make sure that they were safe. And I'll just sort of um, stretch that out a little bit for you. Uh, my son, he, I mean, he, he went into it and um, he started off with a guy, Henry DeLima, who was in our neighborhood. And Henry was one of our guys and quiet guy. And he got a good lesson from him. And then he started working with Dave Denov and Dave was a competitor. And so he got that going. And then, and then later on, like he, you know, like all kids at that generation, they wanted to kick box. So, you know, John, I, I took him as far as I could as a parent and, and John took him as far as he could. And then we introduced him to Mozamo because he wanted to kick box. So he was on his team, got to travel the world with him, which was great. Mm -hmm. My daughter, 
you know, when she was in high school, wanted to be the bad dude, or, you know, because kickboxing was it. So we, you know, I, she trained with me. I wanted to make sure, because back then, you know, the, the, the gyms, the, you know, male ego was horrible, right? Like they, mm -hmm. they, if she punched the one in the nose, they'd try to kill her probably, right? So, because they were just, you know, kids are like that, right? So I, I made sure she trained with me and got it. And today she, you know, she expanded on that. She, um, she wrote the, um, curriculum for yoga therapy she's you know she's big in the yoga she belongs to an international yoga she's a school teacher by trade um but but it was the martial art training so from a from a parent i always relate from a parent's perspective it's the single best thing that you can do for a child they're, uh, the, what they're going to learn from it and the life experiences that they're going to have even if they don't stick with it mm -hmm. are going to be with them for a lifetime so uh, and that's usually the way i go i just you know, as a, I separate myself from from being an instructor to, to being an actual parent. So, um, you know, th this this has been this has been excellent. I, uh, you know, I've I always find I learn something uh, every time I speak with somebody. And, and you know, like you said, the little epiphanies that you get, um, you know, there's a couple of things for me that um, that uh, I, I will definitely pull from from this conversation. Um, is there anything that you wanted to add that we haven't covered or, um, you know, even sharing like where people can find you, your organization, that kind of thing? Um, well, well, for me, I'm, I, I, I contract out and like, we're, we'll, we're going to start back probably September. <laughs> like I, I keep right. my small group together and uh, I, I, I work with a lot of like, I, I'm lucky because I work with a number of clubs and I like, I'll take my black belts in and work with their black belts and, and so they they actually, you know, I've got arrangements with different clubs that uh, we do that. And I, I work with out of Omar Maldonado. He has the summit and mm -hmm. yeah, we, his boys are good. So he, I, I actually rent the facility there. And, and, and of course, you know, like a, a piece of it, right. For my small group. And so with the young athletes and stuff, I've been able to help some of them get into, you know, Ontario winter games and stuff like that. There, there are other people, students, but because of my affiliation as a, you know, instructor, I've been very fortunate to be able to be in a position to, you know, maybe open a couple of doors that, I mean, I, they have to qualify. I can just open the door to get them there, but then they, yeah, it's what they do to, is going to get them there. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if it, it's a little different because a lot of guys, are, you know, running clubs and everything. I'm, I'm just a guy who freelances now. I, you know, I, I go in and I work in, in with the clubs. I run a few classes every week uh, with other guys, black belts as well, but they're under our, our school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they were black, they're black belts in our schools, but they open up clubs. So I more or less just service that the best I can and, and we're and they're all over the country now. So, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, it's a, it, there's a time that, like, you know, you, there's a time where you should get off the dojo floor and just, you know, like maybe <laughs> share, like we're sharing today, this stuff. And and so, yeah, you know, I mean, we live in an amazing country. We we have more. We have a lot of number of world champions per capita that we we, we don't really realize that if you you take the actual population of Canada how how good the martial arts are here mm -hmm. yeah. and saying that, you know, but you look at other countries and we can be better. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just it. I mean, it's good. Good. Well, um, again, really appreciate your, uh, your, your time today and, and um, uh, your willingness to participate in this, I don't, I'm still not sure what, I, what this is, but you know, this little initiative that I have going, um, yeah. you know, you're, uh, I thought it was important to, to, to speak with you because of, um, you know, the, the, the role that you've played, you know, through, and, and, and still are playing, you know, in, in the history of Canadian martial arts and, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm again, really grateful that, uh, you agreed to uh, speak with me today and again, genuinely enjoyed uh, our conversation. So, uh, Thank you again very, very much for, for your time. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, this has been, it's been fun. Yeah, it's been fun. And, and just keep up the good work because, uh, you know, I've enjoyed your YouTube stuff with, uh, with a number of them. Uh, 
They're, uh, they, and you got a lot of the Friday, you know, the Black Belt Hall of Fame. Yeah, I've been lucky so far. So I'm, I'm glad there's people that are willing to speak <laughs> about, yeah. about their experiences and so others learn as well. So um, you know, we've been lucky because we grew up like, you know, with, with, with so many of them and the ones we haven't. Like, you know, I mean, uh, when, when I started, everybody wanted to be Wally and, and Daniel Rouché out of Quebec. And then there was um, um, okay. the Shears out of uh, in, in Saskatchewan. They're, they're big ones. And then all the guys out in BC, like they're, they're you know, the, the, the older guys are the ones we learned from. We, you know, we've been lucky to have Shintani, so close. And then we've had, uh, you know, uh, Soroka, mm -hmm. you know, the Changs, the Chongs, the uh, Park. Uh, I mean, it's just mind-boggling, like, the, the actual access that you have to so many amazing, amazing instructors. Yeah, yeah. Well, we are blessed, for sure, in, in many yeah. ways in that regard. So, again, thank you so, so much for, uh, for your time and, and, uh, and for sharing your, your journey with us today. Really appreciate it. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me on. And I look forward to having a coffee with you one day. <laughs> Indeed. Deal. In person. <laughs> yes, in person. Yes. Excellent. Thank you.